Hello there. I'm calling this uh, clip Mercantilism versus Comparative Advantage. And this is clip number one. And basically what it corresponds to, what sort of motivated me to say, I better cover this, is pages 145 to, um, I guess it's 147 in your textbook in chapter five. Um, you should read it, of course, and uh, it's very important uh, that you read everything. But there are some problems with what your textbook is suggesting. They kind of bother me, kind of raised a few red flags. So the purpose of this clip series is to sort of um, kind of clean this up. Okay, your, your textbook, you know, talks about this concept here of uh, favorable versus unfavorable balance of uh, trade. And, you know, this is, there's sort of a, a bit of a problem here, I think. It's a, let me tell you what it's called. It is a, this is a logical issue. And um, where did I write it down? Yes, here it's called, um, you don't need to know this, it's just this Latin phrase, and I'm probably not even pronouncing it correctly, but it's, it looks sort of like uh, Audi Ultram Partum, okay, um, and what that basically means in English, it means hear the other side. Okay, this is a this is actually an important concept. It it comes up originally actually in constitutional law, or what they call natural justice. It's a type of due process. What it basically means is, if you're accused of crime, uh, then you should be able before you know they come and take you and throw you in jail, or they come and take your property or you know fine you or something. You you know you should be allowed to present your side of the case your side should be heard. Okay, so it is, it is actually also a legal concept that both sides, the state that's prosecuting you, and uh, you um, can hear all the evidence you know, that's brought against you, then you can challenge it in the court of law. Okay, so that both sides of the issue are heard. It's not a one-sided, you know, secret trial where you get tried in secret. You know, the state, the state goes, state to presents the evidence and you get thrown in jail, you can't even present your side or hear you know, what, what uh, are, is the evidence he's against you. That's where it comes from, actually. But it is also a fallacy in logic uh, as well, to some extent, because what it basically means is that you are arguing from assumptions, okay, which you don't bother to state. And your textbook seems to be making an implicit assumption that um, <clears throat> mercantilism is good, basically, by saying, you know, a country should have trade surpluses and trade deficits are bad. In other words, that the current account should be positive and that's a good thing and a small negative, you know, or, or negative current account balance um, is a bad thing. And th there's sort of an implicit, there's some sort of implicit assumptions here that are not really being brought out. And so that this, this view is, is actually not um, as clear cut as your book seems to present it. In fact, um, uh, free trade economists, economists who tend to favor free trade, would actually argue that the, your textbook's position is completely false and wrong and, and it's sort of outdated. And, um, has, has, basically what's going on here is there is, a, there is an argument let me sort of explain this to you. And, and before I do that, I, I think this whole topic of mercantilism and um, versus comparative advantage is really important because it, it, it plays into so many different other courses that you'll probably end up taking as undergraduates that discuss a variety of issues. Uh, these types of issues come up a lot when you're dealing with international trade, but, but they also have a lot of political implications, and also um, you can even argue ethical implications, because this also plays into topics like uh, colonialism, 
right, and stuff like this. Okay, so that that's why this this is, has a lot of it's a, it's actually a far reaching topic. Okay, so basically, what the what the debate is really about this mercantilism versus comparative advantage, which I um, you should already have un, uh, you should already understand comparative advantage from my from my other clips that I'm going to make. I actually haven't made them yet, but I, I will. And you should watch those ones first. This is sort of after you understand comparative advantage, then you know you can uh, you can sort of understand what I'm talking about here. And also, you have to understand the current account, capital account, and the uh, official financing account. So make sure you, you've already watched those videos before you watch this one. Okay, this issue really comes down to this, this sort of debate is about what really is more important. Is the balance of trade actually important or is it the volume of trade? That's the question. Your textbook is taking only one position. It's saying that you know tr it's um, your book is taking the position of balance. That's all that matters. And that positive balances are good and negative balances are inherently bad, right? Using terms like favorable versus unfavorable. Well, this of course ignores the other side. That, that's why I said let the other side be heard. Okay, that's 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 how this is an application of that principle uh, from law and also from logic. Is the volume question? Okay, so so that's what it is: volume or balance? Okay, and th this is an important topic. Okay, there the um, this doctrine that your textbook is 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 proposing is actually a version of mercantilism. Okay, mercantilism is also sort of captured on this other term called the exploitation doctrine. Okay, so exploitation doctrine, mercantilism, sort of same same sort of group. Okay, S same same idea. Now the the mercantilism was. Um, an economic philosophy still exists. In modern times, we call it neo mercantilism, right? Neo, N E O, being, being uh, like new, like neo conservative is the new conservative, neo liberal, new, new liberal. So, this is, so today we have neo mercantilism. But in its traditional form, um, I mean, basically, these guys held certain assumptions, and their assumption was that, that they judged the success of trade by the size of trade balance, like your book is doing. Right? It's the bigger is better kind of philosophy, right? The more we're exporting uh, versus importing, then you know, we're better off, right? The surplus is good, and. Um, so exports bigger than imports. That's the good one. And then the other way around, when uh, you're importing more than you're exporting, that's the you know the bad one. And that's how they thought. Now these guys were actually uh, they originally were um, before Adam Smith came along. Okay, so the Adam Smith. This is basically the same time as the uh, American Revolution, the 1770s, or a very active. Uh, 1770s, about 17, you know, 80s, 1790s were a very active time in the in the world history, and um, so Adam Smith really was more of a critique of all of this mercantilist philosophy. And I'm going to put this into another clip because I'm going to run out of time in a second. But quickly, the point is is that the mercantilists took this um, balance view, the balance of trade. That's what matters. What I'm going to present next is the Smith's view that really it's volume of trade based on this, this law of comparative advantage that actually matters.